Good morning, everyone. My name is Justin Sears, Product Marketing Manager at Hortonworks. It's my pleasure to host our seven webinar series entitled Discover HDP 2.1, covering all the new capabilities for Enterprise Hadoop delivered in Hortonworks Data Platform version 2.1. Today's Apache Hadoop 2.4.0 YARN and HDFS is the fourth webinar in the series. If you've missed any of the last three webinars, you can find those recordings and Q&As on our blog. I'll be your host today, and I'm joined by two Apache Hadoop experts. Rohit Bakshi is a senior product manager at Hortonworks. He is responsible for Apache Hadoop and Apache Solar in Hortonworks data platform. Vinod Vavilapali is one of the original architects of Hadoop. He is now a member of the PMC for Apache Hadoop, and he leads yarn development at Hortonworks. Here's today's agenda. We'll begin with an overview of yarn and HDFS. Then we'll cover new yarn and HDFS features in HDP 2.1, and we'll finish with time for Q&A. We've got 30 minutes, so we're going to move quickly. All attendee phone lines have been muted. If you have questions during the presentation, please send them to Vinod in WebEx chat. Vinod and Rohit will take time to answer those at the end of the call. And if we don't have time to answer all of the questions, we will include a full Q&A in an upcoming blog, blog post about this call. Let me set the stage for Rohit and Vinod. This is a modern data architecture to store and process data from a wide variety of sources. Data comes in structured columnar formats and also newer, less structured formats like those found in human-generated content, like Word documents or emails. Also in weblogs and clickstreams and social content like tweets and in machine, sensor, and geolocation data. You see those newer data types down here at the bottom. Apache Hadoop works well in combination with familiar data repositories like RDBMS, EDW, and MPP, to store and process a full spectrum of data. That data is then available to a variety of data access applications and BI tools to complete many different data workloads. Batch processing, interactive query, stream analysis, NoSQL, search, and others. Today, we'll focus on the data management core of Hadoop, YARN, and HDFS. Through our experience with more than 100 enterprise customers running HDP, we know that enterprises need four additional capabilities to be integrated with data management. They need data access for the applications that use and analyze the data in HDFS. They also need data governance and integration, security for their Hadoop cluster, and tools for cluster operations. In today's webinar, we will focus on data management in Hadoop. We will cover more components of Enterprise Hadoop in additional webinars over the next month, and recordings of previous Discover HDP 2.1 webinars are already available on our blog. So now I'll turn it over to Rohit Bakshi for an overview of YARN and HDFS. Please remember to send Vinod any questions in chat. I'll pass control over to you, Rohit. Great. So Justin set the stage, and what we're going to do is we're going to delve into um, Apache Hadoop, Yarn, HTFS, and talk about what's new in HTTP 2.1. So let's start with an overview. So with, it, with Hadoop 2.0, um, Yarn and HTFS came together to form the new architecture and the new data operating system for your enterprise data platform, for the Hortonworks data platform. What does that mean? What it means is that HTFS scalable, reliable storage and YARN, resource management um, across all your nodes, comes together to form one common data operating system combining all the resources and, and storage resources and compute resources available across your connected cluster. So if you have a, you have a cluster of 100, 500, 1,000 nodes in your data center, all of that is managed through one data operating system which consists of YARN and HDFS and then powers the enterprise data platform capabilities that Justin laid out um, with a holistic view of HTTP 2.1. So with YARN and HTFS, right, you get a flexible data operating system, a flexible data management system. What that means is that you can run multiple different workloads, multiple different compute workloads in the same cluster at the same time, sharing the same resources. And ha all of those multiple varied workloads have access to the same set of data sets, 
raw data sets, transform data sets, data sets ready to publish, all living in HDFS. It's efficient. It's efficient because now you have the ability to run your workloads in Hadoop, in the common set of memory, um, as well as push the processing across different workloads towards where the data lives. So Yarn and HDFS come together to provide you data locality in running your processing workloads. And it's shared. It's shared across all the different enterprise business ap applications, analytical workloads, and use cases that you have in your, in your cluster. Um, it's shared in the sense that you have one common fault-tolerant framework that protects against nodes failing in um, your storage layer, nodes failing in terms of running applications and running workloads across your cluster, and then automatic fault tolerance and automatic restarting of those nodes, of those tasks. It's shared in the sense that there's a common security paradigm across your workload. The common resource isolation and common data isolation available through HDFS and YARN. It's shared in the sense that there's a common monitoring framework where you can monitor all your workloads, um, resource utilization, as well as monitor storage utilization across your cluster, across your workloads. So all that comes together to provide this common, shared, flexible, efficient, and reliable. We have Fortune 500 companies across the world running hundreds and thousands of nodes of HDP, powered by HDFS and YARN, running their enterprise data workloads. So let's get into what's new with HDP 2.1. So let's start with the storage layer, with HDFS. We've made investments in providing greater control and security, so security um, with, act, with granular access patterns to your data set, um, extending how you can give role-based access control to groups and users to different data sets, as well as perimeter security, so HTTPS trans, um, encryption for data transfer across the wire, coming from clients into the cluster, as well as access to the monitoring UIs available in um, HTTPS and in YARN as well. We've gone through the details of these functionalities in, older, in prior webinars a few weeks ago, so I won't delve into the details of that one. But what, what I will touch upon is um, our performance improvements and our read caching ability that we've brought online in HTTP 2.1. So with coordinated data caching in HTTPS, what we provide is an ability to say, I have certain data sets and files that I know are going to be accessed over time repeatedly, and I want to ensure that they're cached in memory so that when a read request comes into those data sets, to those files, it's going to hit memory and not go to disk. And the way you do that is you um, use a centralized management control to identify which data sets you want to be cached, and HDFS takes care of bringing them into the memory and pinning those files in memory for you to read from. There is a set of administrative controls called pools and directives that allow you to manage how much memory is being utilized across these data sets um, for caching and memory, as well as the time to live and um, access controls to that data. So the flow and how this works is that as an admin, you will request that a certain set of files need to be cached. Once you make that request, the main node coordinates with all the different data nodes and says, here's the different files that need to be cached, and then identifies how it can be cached in memory of the data node. So this is cached in the data node memory. Then when applications come in and do requests for that data, they'll hit the RAM of those data nodes to read, the, to read that data instead of going to disk. And so it's across the, um, across the HTTP stack you now have the ability to load data into memory. A key feature that we got bought online and delivered in HTTP 2.1. Now we'll move to what's new in the resource management framework with YARN. So we made investments um, in reliability, in monitoring, and scheduling. And I'm going to pass it over to Vinod to kind of walk through in detail um, the functionality we brought online as well as the architecture behind these improvements. Take it over, Vinod. Thanks, Ramit. Uh, a very good point to you all. So uh, I, I go through some of the features that you know uh, got added on top of uh, HTTP 2.0, which we released last year, October. Um, 
there are three buckets here, like Rohit mentioned, there is the reliability of the resource manager, there is application level monitoring, and then finally, uh, preemption in the scheduler, right? I'll start with the resource manager reliability part. For those of you who have been uh, using HTTP 1.0 uh, you know, X stack, um, you might have had uh, experienced how the reliability work in, in that land, right? Um, you know, there are significant concerns, you know, uh, third party dependencies and stuff like that, which we set out to fix in the HTTP, HTTP uh, 2.1 uh, release. And uh, a quick word for you of uh, the you know, silent features of resource manager uh, reliability, why, why you want it. Uh, if you're managing a cluster, uh, you, you know, across the stack in all components, you want high reliability, which actually means your applications don't, uh, you know, get impacted because of either hardware issues or, you know, software issues causing, you know, master crashes, right? And RMHA, uh, uh, the primary goal is to enable automated failover so that the uh, the stack itself detects any uh, process failures or uh, host failures and automatically, you know, uh, restart transfer control over to a standby resource manager. The architecture is uh, built around an active standby, uh, uh, you know, uh, architecture wherein a standby resource manager always uh, is up and running. It's, uh, it has access to, the sh to a shared state store where the active resource manager is writing its state. Um, it, it, depending on uh, the mechanism of automated failover, uh, any time the active resource manager goes down, the standby takes over and, uh, and uh, the client side never uh, sees any of the impact, right? Uh, along with any HA solution, uh, you also have the problem of split brain when you have two masters running uh, in parallel and you know uh, trying to access a, a common shared store. You you have the issue of fencing where uh, you know you may run into a case where both ma both the uh, demons think they are the masters and that can lead to uh, many issues. It, it it can be data corruption in case of uh, a file system. Um, it could be uh, a state inconsistency in case of uh, a Compute platform like yeah, right? Uh, and RMHA has built-in support for fencing. We also have worked worked hard to make sure that the feature itself is available across the stack, so that uh, all the frameworks that are built on top of Yarn, uh, whether it is MapReduce or Tez or Hive or Pig or OZ or whatever, right? Um, all of those components are already certified. We've uh, you know we have made we made sure that. There's no impact of, uh, on all the components that sit on top of Yarn. And finally, this is integrated right into the HTTP stack. Uh, like I mentioned, if you've uh, experienced the HTTP one, uh, there are many, many solutions which may or may not uh, be part of the, you know, the integrated HTTP stack. So I can quickly go through an, the architecture overview of the thing so that that gives a, a better understanding of how this is done. Um, so in, in a Yarn cluster, you have node manager agent uh, um, you know, running on all all the nodes in the cluster, uh, whether it's a 10 node cluster or a 500 node cluster, and they're all at any point of time communicating with uh, uh, with an active resource manager, right? Uh, that's the one on on your left side. The clients also directly always talk to the active resource manager, and the active resource manager itself uh, maintains state to a uh, to a central state store. I was referring to a central state store. The state store implementation that I have here is a Zookeeper based one. Uh, the RM continuously writes the uh, uh, active state, and anytime uh, you know uh, an, an issue happens on the machine where you know where the resource manager is running, uh, the standby is always listening on, on Zookeeper. It takes the active lock, and uh, once it it takes over the control, the clients are automatically uh, failed over so so the node managers. And because of the work we've done, uh, you know, above the stack, uh, the entire, you know, the user applications frameworks are obvious, oblivious to this uh, failover, and it happens so fast uh, that there is a minimum, minimal blip to the, you know, the mm -hmm. performance of the, of the application. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next, next, next uh, big feature. We implemented what is called the application timeline server. Uh, <laughs> the main goal of this feature is to enable. Uh, Monitoring and even collection of applications. Um, so the fundamental, you know, uh, the reason why we need something like this is uh, as yeah, as as Justin and Rohit talked before, Yarn is uh, positioning itself to the data, pro you know, data operating system, right? 
and in a data operating system there are applications of varied types and you know uh, we have uh, in the in the past worked on making MapReduce a first class application on top of Fion and increasingly there are more applications coming on board and even collection is one of the very common core features that every application needs and that's where application time and server comes in. Um, the way it is implemented is by having a central server which takes an event across from across the applications. It stores all of that on, uh, in, a, in a portable store uh, and depending on your site size you may be uh, running on a local embedded database or uh, it could be uh, an HPS kind of scalable, highly scalable, fault-tolerant uh, store. Once, it, once the events uh, reach there, they're exposed to the end users uh, via REST APIs. Users can build uh, visualizations using the APIs. They can build tools. Uh, they can do performance analysis of, uh, of their applications based on the events. And, and we also want to make sure that it's available for both the end users as well as admins. Admins can uh, make use of this this information to figure out hey what's happening in my cluster how are my queues getting utilized am I uh, doing my capacity planning correctly and stuff like that so that's the overall grand view of timeline server uh, we did a preview of this uh, in, in HTTP 2.1 oh. we enabled uh, you know, frameworks like Ambari along with high vintage to uh, give a give, give some sort of visualizations that I was referring to, uh, specifically in that stack of Hive and uh, Ambari. We wish to enable it for uh, for our Archer uh, framework base going into future. A quick uh, look into the architecture itself. Uh, um, you know, like before, every node manager, every node, every single machine in a cluster is running a node manager. They're running the containers. And in this example, if, if you see the, there are multiple applications running here, there is uh, batch map reduce application, there is uh, a strong application running on top of the they, they all have, you know, they're running for a while, they want to emit metrics and they want to expose it to the end users. And in this example, the, the containers or so the application masters directly send events to the, to the central uh, timeline server, which stores it in a, in a store. Uh, and then tools like Ambari, uh, our, our custom uh, monitoring client written by user can query the information stored in the timeline server and build visualizations and, and so on. And finally, uh, the last feature that we want to cover today uh, with respect to the HTTP 2.1 is capacity scaler preemption. Uh, as you might have known, capacity scaler uh, has been around for a while. It's a, it's a scheduler that's running a few of the largest uh, installations uh, of Hadoop in the world. It, it, has built-in support for capacity users, um, user limits, you know, uh, a whole set of right? And now we are adding uh, preemption to that. Fundamentally, the goal of preemption uh, is to, you know, make sure that queues are queues and resources in the cluster are shared in a very elastic manner in the in, in system. At the same time, uh, the owners of the queues or, or users who submit applications to the queues have reasonable uh, expectations on on their SLAs. To make sure that you know, uh, elasticity also means uh, when, when nobody is using the resources in a queue, they get automatically used by someone who is in the need, right? And when there is a need uh, to get get those resources back, uh, preemption kicks in, and you know that's that's the fundamental goal of this. Right? And the way it does it uh, is a very you know uh, prescribed process. Right? It, uh, it's it's an active thread that's always running inside Yarn. Uh, it gathers queue state uh, at any point of time. It monitors the capacity. What are the guaranteed capacities? How much demand is there? Uh, and then, uh, depending on how the resources are getting used, it it identifies a set of preemptions, right? Which actually means which queue should I, uh, uh, you know, get resources back from, recla reclaim resources from, uh, back from, and also within that queue, uh, which application should I take it back from, right? Uh, and depending on the scheduling policy, you may want to select uh, application which has made the recent progress, you know, most at least prog progress, or you know, uh, it, there, there are a whole lot of conf conflicting uh, dimensions to it, depending on uh, what your original requirement was. So depending on that, it chooses uh, uh, an application, and within that application also there is one more policy to figure out which container should you know should I preempt. Right after it does that, it it it, it actually goes ahead and makes preemption, and preemption uh, in this uh, in this terminology is not. Uh, directly killing containers. We also want to enable applications to act on act on preemption. Um, if you imagine an Apple application or you know, or say a Storm application, if they have, uh, if they get an opportunity to kind of 
persist or stayed, you know, uh, stored their state before getting preempted, uh, so that they can continue from from there. Then extend the uh, restart. That that's a great. That's a very great, you know, uh, ability for the application. So that that is that is how preemption is done. We do it in two phases. First, we inform the application um, to say, hey, I'm I'm going to preempt this this container or this set of containers. Try to uh, you know, do it yourself by either storing your stored or state or you know, do whatever it takes so that uh, you can continue from there uh, in the next cycle. In the event that uh, the application doesn't uh, uh, react on the preemption signal, uh, the resource manager, the framework itself, explicitly goes ahead and tweaks the containers and so that it can satisfy requests from other queues. So that's the overall goal of preemption. Um, work, you know, work is still being done to. Uh, you know, make it more powerful, make it understand more features in the scheduler, uh, stabilize it and stuff, but, you know, that, that's the overall um, uh, picture of preemption. I think that closes my coverage on the features in um, in Yarn. Uh, clearly, there's much more that already we have already shipped as part of 2.0 last October itself. This is just the delta from there. So for those of you who haven't, uh, you know, have gotten attention to how much Yarn Excel percent and sure uh, some of the past webinars have helped you. I think I'm done. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we'll um we'll open up to questions now. And so I've taken a looked at the chat, so I'm taking a few questions. So the first question for you um to know is actually the question on how is speculative execution handled with Matthews and Yarn? Has it changed at all from the one dot X? The 2.0 world. So, the question, yeah. So, speculative execution is a MapReduce feature. Mm -hmm. um, it it actually works much better in Heroku Auto. We uh, we implemented speculative execution in the MapReduce application master. Of course, that that, that actually means uh, not a lot of other frameworks can use it, but we built it in such a way that it's a library that can be embedded in other frameworks. Uh, but but the short answer is yes, speculative execution works. Uh, it actually works much better. We have implemented much better heuristics uh, to figure out how to speculate, how to you know uh, kill uh, you know parallel tasks and stuff like that. Thanks. And the next next question um, that I'll take is, what are the UIs available today for monitoring applications in HTTP 2.1? So what we have today, um, we continue to have the MapReduce job history server. So if you're familiar with what we had in the Hadoop 1.x and we had in Hadoop 2.0 and HTTP 2.0, we have that functionality available through um, through the job tracker history server. We also have a new functionality with um, Ambari where we have the hive and save jobs view. And so this is what Vinod was alluding to, where it takes advantage of the application timeline server, and it pulls event metrics um, from that server and visualizes it so you can get a DAG view of Hive jobs running the phase of the runtime engine. And you can see um, metrics for each DAG um, and, and visualize and understand the performance of your job. And over time, over the next few releases, we'll add a lot more visualizations, really harnessing the power of this common monitoring framework for HTTP. Another question that we got was, um, what do you mean by full stack resiliency when it comes to Resource Manager HA? And this is something that Vinod was alluding to as well. Um, what we did when we certified Resource Manager HA is we ensured that we tested the entire stack of components, and the stack of components being the data active stack that Justin was giving an overview of before. So Hive, Pig, MapReduce jobs, phase jobs, age phase running on top of and, and interacting with the resource manager, um, as well as with HDFS and mainnode HA, all these different applications, we made sure that if you bring down the resource manager, you bring down the name node, they're resilient, they pause, they retry. Um, the idea is that we don't want any service disruption. When an enterprise deploys this in production, there's no service disruption if they have a failure event, if one of the resource managers goes down. It's automatic failover and all the applications on top um, can recover and don't need any manual intervention to restart the job and resubmit the job. They continue to completion. And that's what we mean by full stack resiliency. And what that means for the operator and for the cluster and the enterprise customer is that you don't have to worry um, that if a, if a node goes down, you're going to have a failure. The system is 
is architected to handle those failures and keep on going. Another question that we got um, is on data locality. So when it comes to YARN and HDFS, so we talked about data locality being a feature. So we know that you can give some thoughts on how is that implemented and how does that work and what does that mean for, let's say, a MapReduce app or for another app that's running on YARN? How does it take advantage of data locality? So data locality is a feature that's, again, implemented uh, across both YARN platform as well as the applications. Uh, the YARN scheduler understands uh, when the applications come and say, hey, my, um, you know, my, either, my, either my safest blocks are in these set of machines or racks, right? It understands the fact that you know, users can come in and say, uh, give me a bunch of containers on this machine, on this rack, because either because of your uh, you know, HDFS blocks depending on the same set of machines, or you have some software that is only installed on that set of machines. So Yarn understands overall uh, you know, the concept of locality. You can ask uh, containers on specific host and machines, but it's, it's entirely up to the application to figure out how, how the machines are tied to their, the data or, or specific software running on a subset of machines. So in the MapReduce land, MapReduce application master comes in and says, hey, my HTTPS blocks are on a set of machines and this set of racks. Let me convert them into what we call the resource request that, uh, that is YAN's parallels for locality. Uh, and then once it goes to Yarn, uh, Yarn understands, hey, this application is asking me to give containers on this smaller subset of machines or racks. Let me try to give that on a, on a best, you know, case by, uh, best case, depending on, of course, other uh, scheduling invariants like capacities, user limits, and stuff like that. So it, overall, it's, it's a synergy between the application and the platform. Platform gives the ability to uh, let, you know, let you specify the locality of, uh, of your uh, containers. And then, you know, once you submit the request, Jan will be expressed to do that. Yeah. Thanks. And, and one final question that we got um, is around, so here, here actually the question, um, if Jan and HTTPS are for storage memory management, which daemon does the processing? So what's the job tracker's work? So where does the data processing happen? Good question. So the new architecture that we have um, for HTTP 2.0, that work of doing the data processing is split between the resource manager in Yarn and the different application masters. So let's take MapReduce for example, right? Job Tracker was responsible for scheduling MapReduce jobs as well as monitoring and making sure the MapReduce jobs ran to execution and keeping track of all the tasks for a MapReduce job. Now in the Yarn world, you have the resource manager of Yarn who's in charge of scheduling and giving resources to a MapReduce job. And then you have a MapReduce application master, which is one of the one process that's spawned by the MapReduce job in Yarn that's responsible for keeping track of all the mappers and the reducers, making sure they finish, and coordinating the process. For Storm, you have uh, another application master that's responsible for Storm. For Phase, you have a Phase application master. So now, because we split out the application ma management from Job Tracker, into its own different um, different application frameworks, you can actually run different types of applications frameworks, not just on Yarn. Re We're good, Justin. Back to you. Great. Can you advance one more slide? Let's look at the last slide, and then we'll wrap up. Absolutely. So we'll, we'll so if you. Want any more information? Thanks for coming online. Um, if you want any more information, we have a lot of information on our website. We have a last page that talks about the different features in Yarn and how we progressed over time, um, and kind of calls out how you can think about running multiple different workloads in the same cluster through Yarn and HDFS. And we have another webinar coming up um, in, on June 12th, where we'll dive into solar and search for HTTP. Let well, let me be the first to thank um, both Vinod and Rohit for taking time to sh you guys. Thanks for taking time to share your expertise around Yarn, HDFS, and data management. As, as Rohit mentioned, um, we have a lot of information about what's been done in Yarn, what's already been delivered as part of that effort. Um, that's on our website. And um, coming up, um, we have a couple weeks off from our webinar series um, because of Hadoop Summit. 
Um, but on Thursday, June 12th, Rohit will be back with us to talk about Apache Solar. So I want to thank everyone that attended. Um, if, if we didn't answer your question because of time, there will be a blog post about this um, webinar with a recording. And so watch our blog for that. If you haven't signed up for the remaining three Discover, uh, Discover HB 2.1 webinars, you can do that from hortonworks.com forward slash webinars. You see that on the screen. And as I mentioned, the next one will be on June 12th. We hope you can join us for that on June 12th. And this ends today's webinar. Thank you very much.